understand. The, the, the ball, when he releases it, will race to the plate. It, it looks like it's going to be a ball. It's going to miss the plate, but at the last minute, it, it, it makes just enough movement to cross, cross over a corner of the plate, and it, it becomes a strike, or it's going, and it looks like it's going to be a strike, and, and at the last minute, it dips down below the batter's bat. He swings and misses because somehow that pitcher gets that movement on, on the ball. But there's another pitch called a, a knuckleball that is a little bit different. The way the pitch moves, the way the ball moves is that the, the pitcher will cause it to spin in a certain way. And, and when it spins that way, it behaves a certain way. But the knuckleball, as they call it, doesn't spin or, or it doesn't spin very much. It just sort of flies toward the plate. It's, it's slower than the other pitches, but you can't tell what it's going to do. Because it's moving slowly and it's not spinning very much, the, the seams on the baseball will catch the air and cause the ball to move in a different way. And, and if you watch closely, it looks almost like a whiffle ball on the way to the plate. And the batter doesn't know where the ball is going to be. The pitcher doesn't know where the ball is going to be. The catcher certainly doesn't know where the ball is going to be. You may know the name Bob Euchre. Uh, he was a, a catcher in MLB. He once said that the best way to, to catch a knuckleball is wait until it stops rolling and pick it up. It's hard to catch a knuckleball because you just don't know where it's going to be. There's so much uncertainty. It's really a bit of a risk to use that pitch. There aren't a lot of pitchers who use a knuckleball for that reason because of the risk. You know, we look at life sometimes and we recognize that it is a bit of a risk. We don't know which way it's going to go. Sometimes it seems to be going one way and then it breaks in the other direction. It seems to be going this way and, and it drops out of sight. We, we weren't anticipating it. We weren't thinking it was going that way. And with all of that uncertainty, sometimes we feel like we've been knocked flat. Sometimes we feel like we are just completely out of energy. But there's something that God wants for us. Opening our Bible to the passage that was just read in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, I want you to notice what we read, and we're just going to look at verses 3 and 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, you, you probably noticed this just a moment ago in the Scripture as Colin read it. But blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. It's a passage that, that's really kind of hard for us to read because our eye sees the word comfort and thinks, well, I just read that. I must be in the wrong place, but we're in the right place. In fact, if we read here in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 7, and we look at those five verses together, the word for comfort or consolation, it's the, the noun and verb form of the same word It's found ten times in those five verses. Paul, by inspiration, is definitely getting a message across. He's saying, through comfort, through consolation, I want you to gain the emotional strength that you need to get through all of this uncertainty. To be able to handle life when it's like that knuckleball and you don't know which way it's going to break. It may break your way, it may break another way, and you just don't know. Whether it's an election, or wars, or riots and violence. Whether it's immorality, or unbelief, or bullying. Whether it's the economy, or sorrow, or, or, or disappointment. We need comfort as we live in this troubled world. And Paul's message there in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 7 is, God wants you to have comfort. God wants you to, to have the peace that you need. We looked at that a little bit this morning, this evening. I want us to go at this at maybe a, a little different direction. Through all of the trials and difficulties of life, have comfort, have consolation. How do we get there? Four things I want us to think about. Number one is this. To have comfort in a troubled world, don't allow your discouragements to defeat you. It doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter how much money we have. 
It does not matter how well known we may be. It does not matter how much of of what this world calls success that, that we might enjoy. The reality is there are things that happen in this life that have the potential to bring us down. Now, I don't know how many of you know exactly who Scott Hamilton is. Is if you did if you never followed figure skating then then you may not know but uh, but Scott Hamilton won four consecutive U.S. figure skating championships four consecutive U, uh, world figure skating championships he won the gold medal in the 1984 Olympics and if you ever watched figure skating you know he was a consummate performer when he became pro especially he would do something that would make you just laugh and then. Follow it up with something so athletic, it leaves your your jaw on the floor. You you just don't know how he does that. He was just able to perform and do all of that. But as he kept performing, in fact, he was still performing professionally when in 1997, he battled cancer. And he beat that battle. In 2004, he had a brain tumor. And he fought it and he beat it. In in 2010, another brain tumor. In 2016, another one. And one after the other, he kept going. Even after he retired from skating because he was just getting older, he kept announcing, he kept doing things, he kept going. He never stopped doing things through everything that was going on in his life. So what's the key? How did he do it? Here's what he said. He put it this way. He said, I calculated once how many times I fell during my skating career 41,600 times but here's the funny thing I got up 41,600 times and that's a good way to put it but he's talking about skating he fell and he got up but he's talking about his life I've gone through these things and and every time I've gotten knocked down I've gotten back up and it's exactly what we need that's the key when we're discouraged when we get knocked down what we need to do is get up think with me about a couple of passages that we find in the book of Psalms first Psalm 18 verse 4 the words there tell us the pangs of death surrounded me and the floods of ungodliness made me afraid we've probably been there a time or two in our life now look at verse 6 same psalm in my distress I called upon the Lord and he heard me or maybe it's it's Psalm 31 verse 9 and then verse 14 verse 9 of Psalm 31 have mercy on me O Lord for I am in trouble my eye wastes away with grief verse 14 but as for me I trust in you O Lord look at the difference this is life as it's lived this is life as you and I experience that we we get knocked down and what we've got to do is is to not Stay down, but but get up to look to the Lord. Psalm 42, verse 3 gives us the same idea. My tears have been my food night and day while they continually say to me, Where is your God? Verse 11. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God. I'm not done, he says. This has been difficult. This has been hard on me, but I'm still looking to God. Psalm 73, we see this psalm of a man named Asaph, verse 2. But as for me, he says, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped, he says. Look down at verse 28. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart. Folks, that is exactly what you and I need. That is exactly the message that needs to resonate within us in my life and in yours as we go through these situations that drag us down, that discourage us. Don't let the discouragement defeat you, but look to God. See who He is and through faith, keep going. Like Scott Hamilton, you get knocked down 41,600 times, get up. 41,600 times. Don't allow discouragement to defeat you. But not only that, in the second place, folks, in order to have comfort in a troubled world, take one step at a time. I think this one's kind of hard for us. We like instant everything. 
you name it, we, we've turned it into instant. There is instant jello, instant coffee, instant mashed potatoes, instant rice. I'm deeply offended. There's instant grits to be found. That's one thing that shouldn't be done instantly. It takes time to get them right. If you're in a hurry for lunch, you stop by and get some fast food somewhere. It probably has some meager nutritional value, but you can get it quickly. You can get in, get out, and be on your way. We're accustomed to things being fast. Communication in our world is something that nobody has ever seen before. The very idea that we carry a phone with us everywhere, and it's not just a, a phone. We, in fact, we have some people who aren't even sure you can use it as a phone. It's just a texting device or email device. You search the internet on it. We, we can have all of this immediate communication, social media, instant messaging. It's all there. We're accustomed to things that are just right there. The second we push a button, that's the way we think it should be. And sometimes we start to think that's the way life as a Christian should be. That's the way my growth as a Christian should be. I've known several young Christians and some who weren't so young, but maybe they were newer Christians or let's face it, no matter who we are, sometimes we get frustrated that we're not, not growing fast enough. We're just not going forward at, at the pace we thought. I thought I'd be in a different place in my life. And, and we get frustrated and, and when we're tired of taking one step at a time. I don't want to take the next step. I want to be up there. And, and it takes one step at a time. Think about some of the passages that we find in our New Testament. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 2, Peter says, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the Word, that you may grow thereby. Get into God's Word and you will grow. Well, our children, they don't grow immediately. It's not all at once. There are stages from the time they're a little baby and can't do anything for themselves until they leave home and are doing everything for themselves. As parents, it's tough to think about that and we still want to remind them how we help them learn to walk or something else. But they're doing everything for themselves now and it took, it took time. That there are steps that, that got them there. Or maybe it's in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58 where Paul writing says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding, notice, in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. There is a labor, there is a work in the Lord, and it's not something that comes all at once that we can say, okay, here's the one big thing I did for the Lord, but instead there are just steps that we take the entire life that we live doing the Lord's will with, with whatever comes our way. That's the work of the Lord. We've got to take it step by step. In Matthew 7 and verse 24, Jesus said, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who, who built his house on the rock. Well, that's our life. And you go and you build that house, there's some effort that goes into it. It's not something that happens all at once. You don't start with the roof. You've got to start with, with digging the footing and getting the foundation and getting everything set and then take step by step to build that house. The same thing is true in my life and yours. We've got to take one step at a time, following Jesus, doing His will, following the, the Scriptures. It doesn't happen all at once. It's bit by bit. And when you find yourself getting discouraged, when you find yourself having a rough time and you're wondering, how do I get through in, in a troubled world like this? Don't worry about that step way up there. Just take one step at a time. The next step of following Jesus, the next step, of doing His will. That's how we get through in a world like this. But then there's something else I want us to do. If we're going to find comfort in a troubled world, ask for help. This is one of the tough ones, I think. It's part of our culture. It's sort of built into us, I think, as Americans. We, we look at ourselves as being independent. I can do it myself. I've got this. I don't need anybody else. I don't need somebody's help. I'm going to do this myself. A couple of years ago, there was a man by the name of James Melville who was running the New York Marathon. After more than three 
hours of running. Let that phrase sink in. Three hours of... I wouldn't have been there. I'd have been laying on the pavement a couple of hours back. But, but after three hours of running, his body just gave out. He was a little over 200 yards from the finish line. And he just he collapsed. And the runners who were around him and behind him came and lifted him up, got him to his feet, and helped him to make sure he could get across the finish line. He needed just a little bit of help. A little bit of help to get across the line. A little bit of help to finish that race. And I know we like to be self-sufficient. We like to be fiercely independent. But sometimes, no matter who we are, we need help. In Galatians 6, beginning with verse 1, Paul wrote and said, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also are tempted. So somebody stumbles. They, they do what they shouldn't do. They're overtaken in a trespass. They sin. You help them to their feet. You, you help them to come back to the Lord. You restore them. You realize that could be me, so don't look down your nose at them. And you get them to their feet and help them back into that walk, into that race, following Jesus Christ. Now verse 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So if it's a sin, help them to their feet. If it's not a sin, if it's just a burden that's weighing them down, sometimes we need help. Sometimes we need somebody to, to help us along, to get us where we need to be. I love the way that we find it in Deuteronomy chapter 3 and verse 28. There we find the words of Moses for the people of Israel regarding Joshua. Now Joshua was the one who was serving Moses. He was ministering to Moses. And he was going to lead God's people when Moses died. Moses wasn't going to be able to go into the promised land because of his sin. Joshua was the one who would lead after him. Notice what Moses said to the people. Deuteronomy 3 verse 28. He says, but command Joshua and encourage and strengthen him for he shall go over before this people. I want you to help him. Well, isn't he leading? Yes. And he's going to need your help. What a great thought. When you and I look at Joshua in the Old Testament, we see a strong man. We see a faithful man. We see a stalwart servant of God. And here Moses is saying, if he's going to be that, he needs you to help him across the line. It's true of every single one of us, no matter who we are. Somewhere along the way, we're going to need some help. At the end of every sermon, I extend the invitation. It's not my invitation. It, it's not the invitation of the Portland Church of Christ. It's the invitation of Jesus Himself. And in that invitation, we, we want people to know that if they need to obey the gospel, to be buried with Jesus in baptism, to have their sins washed away, they can do that. That's why I always include the plan of salvation in my, in my conclusion, in that invitation somewhere. I want people to hear it. Somebody says, you know, sometimes it's all Christians who are gathered. I mean, we don't need to hear the plan of salvation. I beg to differ. I believe we do. We need to be reminded of these things. And we have little ones who I want to grow up, having heard that so many times, it can never leave their mind for the rest of their life. I want them to know what is called upon us to do to be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, that we are washed in His blood. And so we extend the invitation so someone can come to Christ. Or maybe it's someone who has come to Christ, but somewhere along the way they, they left the path, they stopped walking with the Lord and the invitation is so they know they can come home. They can come. By the way, that invitation of Christ, while certainly we extend it at the end of every sermon, it's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If somebody comes to, to recognize their need to be baptized into Christ, don't wait until Sunday. This is about your soul's salvation. The time is now. Somebody says, what if it's 10 o'clock at night? Yes. 
What if it's 2 a.m.? Yes, the time is now. We need you to be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. His blood was shed to take away your sin. You can't earn this. You need to come and be where that blood is. Be washed in that blood. If you need to come home, come home. Start talking to people. Contact one of the elders or the preacher or one of the, the faithful Christians here. We need to get these things taken care of. That invitation is always open. In addition to that... In that invitation of Christ, whether it's at the end of the sermon or as we spend time with one another, there could be a Christian who's going through some tough times. And it doesn't have to do with some personal sin on their part, but it's just life is difficult and I need the prayers of my brethren. And you, you can ask for that. We, we welcome that. We'll pray with you and, and for you every Sunday morning. After the sermon, there are two elders in a room down this hallway and, and just turn left and left immediately into that classroom. There are two elders who are there. You can come and talk to them. They want you to do that. If there's something you need, you can talk to them. Any of the elders would very quickly say, even if it's not when those two elders are there, you can come find an elder anytime and talk to that elder about what you need or the preacher or one of the faithful other Christians who are here. Because we all need help sometimes. It's not something of which to be ashamed. It's not something to hide and try to pretend it isn't, isn't real. We, we need help. We, we need to make sure that we're ready and willing to do that. If you want to be able to have comfort in this troubled world, ask for help. The church family is here for you to help you to walk with Jesus Christ. But then number four this evening, in order to have comfort in a troubled world, this really is what gives teeth to the rest of these. Make every day about Jesus. There's a temptation for us to make life about Jesus as long as things are going pretty well. Yeah, as long as things are going pretty smoothly, I'm pretty healthy, I'm fairly happy in my life, I'm financially secure, the people around me are pretty much doing what I would want them to do. It it's something where we kind of float along. We say, yes, I'm following Jesus. But then when something goes wrong, our health begins to fail. The finances are sort of uncertain suddenly. Or, or somebody does something we never wanted them to do. Then sometimes our, our first impulse is to try to go off in our own direction. To do it our own way and, and leave Jesus out of it. But that's the path to disaster. Folks, if we want to have comfort in a troubled world, make every day about Jesus. How do you do it? Well, you've got to start by being one of His people. Ephesians 1 and verse 7. In Him, in Jesus, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, being baptized into Christ to have our sins washed away. If, if it's a Christian who has done wrong and you've turned away from Jesus, come home to Him. Be one of His people. If you want to make every day about Jesus... Start the day by thinking about how you can serve Him. In Matthew 4 and verse 19, we find Jesus calling disciples and what He said to them was, follow Me. Make that your life. Think about different ways that you can follow Jesus. Start your day by saying, okay, I know these things are going to happen. Here's how I can follow Jesus in these things. Here are some things that could happen. Here's how I'm going to follow Jesus if those things happen. Let's make sure that we're thinking about how to serve, how to follow Jesus. If you want to make your everyday about Jesus, watch your thought life. In Philippians 4 and verse 8, Paul tells us we need to meditate on those things that are true, that are noble, that are just, that are pure, that are lovely, that are of good report. Meditate. Put your mind on these things and think through those things. What am I allowing into my mind? What is my thought life? Let's get our thought life right. If we want to make every day about Jesus, make sure you stay in His Word. John chapter 8, verse 31, Jesus said that we are to abide in His Word. That word abide is interesting. It has that sense of, of being in and staying with. We, we know what the Word of God says and we apply it to our life and we keep doing it day after day. Stay in the Word of God. 
And if you want to make every day about Jesus, lean on Jesus in everything. For everything, lean on Him. Matthew 11 and verse 28, Jesus said, Come to Me, you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You want to have comfort in a troubled world. Make every day about Jesus. Looking at these four things. Having comfort in a world that has the troubles we see if we ever tune in to the evening news. How do we have that comfort? Don't allow discouragement to defeat you. Take one step at a time. Ask for help. And make every day about Jesus. When we struggle, when we hurt, when we fail, the key to overcoming, the key to thriving is Jesus Himself. It's being in Him. It's living as His people. Some years ago, I read an interesting interview. A man named Lee Strobel, who previously had been a journalist, was interviewing different thinkers regarding religion, Christianity, and, and these are, are often denominational thinkers that he interviews. In fact, they all are, but one of them is a philosopher by the name of Peter Kreeft. And as they were talking about human suffering and what's involved in it, there's an interesting statement. Kreeft says that the answer to human suffering is not an answer at all. He says, it's the answerer, says Kreeft. This is written by Lee Strobel. It's Jesus Himself. It's not a bunch of words. It's the Word. It's not a tightly woven philosophical argument. It's a person. The person. The answer to suffering cannot just be an abstract idea because this isn't an abstract issue. It's a personal issue. It requires a personal response. The answer must be someone, not just something, because the issue involves someone. God, where are you? And he answered. He gave his son who came to this earth, who lived among men, who shed his blood to take away our sin. Folks, when we struggle, and we will struggle, when we hurt, and we will hurt. The only place to go is to Jesus. Come to Him to be cleansed of your sin. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. In Him, in Christ, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Come to Him as the Bible teaches, hearing the Word of God, believe. Repent of your sin and confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Be buried with Him in baptism for the remission of your sins and your sins will be washed away. Then you become a Christian, a child of God. As a Christian, be faithful. So I says, well, I, I did that, but somewhere along the way, I got off the path. Somewhere along the way, I... I started walking away from Jesus. I turned away from Him and I've been going in that direction. What, what do I do now? I mean, I've been baptized into Christ. What, what now? In 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, John says, My little children, these things I write to you that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and He Himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only but also the sins of the whole world that that word propitiation is one of those big words we see and our brain comes to halt propitiation means appeasing sacrifice he is the propitiation for our sins he is the sacrifice that is sufficient the only one who could be sufficient to take away the sins of the world because he is the only one who lived without sin and because of that he is our advocate before the throne of the father to say yes this one has been cleansed by my blood so if you're a christian you you turn from walking in the Lord. You've walked in sin. Come home. Repent of your sin. Confess that sin to the Lord. He will forgive you. Won't you come right now? 
as we stand and as we sing. verse is number 823, Mansion of the Hilltop, 823. And if you didn't have the chance to take the Lord's Supper this morning, it's prepared for you in room 8. If you go out either of these doors, there will be someone back there to assist you while we sing this song. <clears throat>